So, yes. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction and also for uh, having me here in this very nice uh, series of uh, online seminars. And um, also thanks to all the participants who would like to contribute to the discussion. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk about you know these uh, keywords that are in in the in this in, in the seminar title, and uh, I'm pretty sure you uh, some of you is already familiar with the topic. Um, and maybe I think if I'm not uh, wrong, there was also uh, probably before summer another talk uh, almost related to what I'm going to tell you. But uh, let me start from actually uh, <laughs> something that I noticed yesterday because I, I went to the to the website to the work website and I noticed that the seminar was advertised as a, as a, um, let's see if I can move yeah it was advertised as a seminar related to ADSFD now some of you may be disappointed because this is not really an ADS-CFT seminar. I mean, I'm not going to discuss ADS-CFT in any detail because my main research interest, as also Jose said, uh, is uh, basically the um, extending holographic dualities beyond ADS-CFT, so beyond the negative cosmological constant space-time. Despite this, it's quite, you know, the, the, it's not so wrong to say that the seminar is related to ADS-CFT, because I will try to make sure that uh, um, it is going to be clear that my, you know, underlying sort of thoughts when trying to extend uh, uh, holography beyond uh, ADS-CFT actually goes deeply uh, into the uh, the mechanism of ADS-CFT and, uh, you know, trying to understand how or whether such mechanism also extends to, to other kinds of holographies, in particular flood space time. But despite this, you know, this is my main motivation. But um, I also would like to make uh, extremely clear the fact that uh, I think probably 90% of the things that we are going to say today do not have anything to do in principle with the holographic principle. And in fact, you can actually state uh, the entire uh, talk just by starting from the, uh, the question of what is what are the um, fundamental symmetries of uh, of nature, and in particular, I stress of well known paradigms of nature. One of these well known paradig paradigms of nature is uh, general relativity that uh, we all uh, know and love. So, because of this, if you happen working, I mean, we are all, we are all young researchers uh, exploring the mysteries of gravity and quantum gravity. So we may approach and may have different bias and we may approach the problem from dif different perspectives. But so if you happen to work on one of these topics that uh, I have uh, sketched here in these uh, yellow clouds, then, well, you may have something to, to teach me uh, or to teach to the flat holography community. So, okay, this is uh, enough for, I think, the uh, invitation to, to the seminar. And uh, just an advertisement, I will speak uh, mostly, or actually I will build the discussion such that we can actually then uh, discuss one of my recent papers with the, this great set of collaborators, Rar Mitra, Aaron Poole, and Vinat um, and basically some of my past research uh, which deals with the understanding of the asymptotic structure of uh, higher dimensional asymptotically flat space times. Now, if you just, I have to give you, um, if I just have to give you some slogan as, as a motivation for this body of works, then I will just say that uh, I was interested with my collaborators to understanding universal features of gravitational scattering and uh, how this relates to the flat holography problem, as I already said. And uh, I will now delve a bit more into these motivational remarks. And uh, let me tell you that the um, that the, basically the talk I I have shaped it such a way in such a way that it's um, divided into three main blocks. Uh, one is the one we are entering now, so motivations and aims. Um, and then in the second part, I will try to actually uh, tell you a bit of uh, the conceptual and technical mechanisms uh, of, of the story, but uh, from basically explaining them via pictures or cartoons. 
And then in the last part, uh, if we have time and uh, uh, if we want, I will give you some more uh, some more details uh, on you know the the recent uh, research uh, uh, papers. Um, so, of course, I mean, probably Jose already said, but maybe we can uh, reserve the the questions for the end. But you can also, I mean, if there are urgent questions, please stop me at any point. I am happy to discuss and then to cut if we need to if we need to cut uh, later on. So, as a motivation, uh, let me first start from recalling uh, a very well known fact from quantum field theory which is uh, the statement that uh, if we have uh, a, an amplitude, let's say, in gauge theory, or in our case, in gravity, in which there is um, at least one graviton uh, which uh, uh, becomes soft, meaning that uh, the, the energy or the momentum of the, of the graviton is, uh, is uh, tending to zero, then you can imagine performing a Taylor expansion in the energy or in the momentum of, of the graviton and uh, and the amplitude basically factorizes. And the result is that the first few terms of this uh, Taylor expansion are universal. Um, in particular, here I show in the in the picture just two terms, the so-called the leadings of theorem that was discovered by Weinberg already in 1965, and the subleadings of theorem that was discovered by Cachazzo and Strominger uh, 10 years ago. But there is also another sub sub of theorem discovered, I guess, by Ashok Sen, who also proved, uh, and collaborators, who also proved that there are no other universal soft factors in, uh, in gravity. So let me stress what does it mean? You can perform the Taylor expansion in the, in the power of momentum, but only these first two or three terms are going to be universal in the sense that they do not depend on the detail, as you can see, for example, from these two examples, of the detail of the coupling of the uh, other particles participating in the scattering to the crowd. And in fact, this was a quite a remarkable result already in 1965 um, that connects basically the leadings of theorem to uh, the equivalence principle. But I will come back to, to this point uh, um, to, to this brief, uh, short historical remark uh, later. Now, how the story actually unfolds, starting from these soft theorems, as you can see, there is uh, uh, a soft theorem that has been discovered uh, pretty much, you know, uh, basically recently, um, and and uh, and this actually is uh, is highly connected with the story that was uh, started to be uncovered by Andy Strominger's and these collaborators, that the soft theorems, the quantum field theories of theorems are a manifestation of asymptotic symmetries of, if I speak about gravity, asymptotic symmetries of the space time. If I speak about gauge theories, asymptotic symmetries of the gauge theory. So what we would also call the large gauge symmetries. I will, Tell you a bit more. There is a question, maybe I see, or Shall it's I... not a question. It's, it's just a, a general warning that people can ask anonymous questions if they want. Please, please. Ah, continue okay. Okay. Um, um, yeah. So I already told you what soft theorems are, and uh, I just used the the word uh, asymptotic symmetries, but I still have to define what asymptotic symmetries are. Here you see a picture in which on the left uh, there is uh, the representation of soft theorems that I gave before. And on the right hand side, we have just a pictorial representation of uh, the asymptotic symmetries at null infinity, which again I have to define. But to start to get used to the color convention, because this will be, you know, will simplify things as we go on. Um, the um, basically the blue things and the red things on both sides match. And I will show you this in, in the second part of the talk. Now, just for completeness, uh, but I'm pretty sure that uh, you are familiar with this uh, story, um, the, um, the soft theorems asymptotic symmetries form what is called an infrared triangle together with another effect, which is pretty well known 
uh, in, in gravitational literature, which is called gravitational wave memory effect. And again, I'm pretty sure that you have seen this picture several times in various talks. Just for completeness, the gravitational wave memory effect, just to remind you, is basically uh, the, the, the claim that uh, um, if you consider um, uh, the, the phenomenon, for example, of two black holes that collide and, uh, and merge together, then the amplitude of the, of the waveform do not come back to, let's say, the original zero, but there is a small offset. And this is understood in, in simple terms by saying that there are two observers, uh, maybe the, the arms of the, of the gravitational wave interferometer, whose proper distance before and after the, the wave is uh, the, the, the wave phenomenon, the wave process, um, the, the proper distance is, is not um, equal between initial and final time. Um, yeah, so this is this is an effect that was already discussed again in gravitational literature in the 70s. And of course, people are getting interested into this uh, in, in, in current days uh, where we actually have some gravity wave astronomy going on. Um, but I'm not going to discuss this point now. I am really interested just in the relationship between asymptotic symmetry and soft theorems because Soft theorems exist in any number of dimension greater or equal to four. Or actually, I mean, they are even better defined in dimensions greater, the, uh, greater than four because there are no infrared divergences in, uh, in higher dimensional quantum field theories. The S matrix is perfectly well defined. And so the question is quite naturally uh, comes uh, basically in front of you. Is the relationship between soft theorems and asymptotic symmetries a generic property of gravitational theories independently of the dimension of the space-time. Um, as you can see, so far, I didn't discuss holography at all. And still, you know, this is something that is I, I highly connected with many uh, aspects of uh, gravitational research. I will now, uh, because this was also my goal, uh, tell you my take, you know, on and actually the take of many other people that are more in the holographic community of why this story connects with the program of flat space-time holography. But before moving to that part, I also want to to show you just uh, just for a second a sort of historical um, an historical curiosity. I think that you are all, uh, you all know these two books on general relativity. One is the, the first one is the 1971 big book by Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, which discusses uh, basically gravity from a very geometric point of view. And the other one is the book by Steve Weinberg, um, in which he tries to keep uh, geometry to the bare minimum. And if we read the, the preface of, of Weinberg's book, we see that he was actually not satisfied at all with the geometric description of gravity, because he considered this to put gravity so far apart from the other, from the other fundamental interaction, from the discussion of the other fundamental interaction. And then he actually noticed that, OK, if you, if you pursue you know, the standard way of thinking about gravity in geometrical terms, you wonder why you should have the equivalence principle. And in fact, in this point of view, the equivalence principle is a consequence of the Weinberg soft theorem, so, so the soft theorems that he discovered, because of this uh, basically universal coupling of the graviton that stems from, from quantum field theory with, uh, uh, with any particle. Now, so this was just a curiosity. I'm not going to 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 to, to to, to base my talk on this, but you know, it, it's nice to actually see now that maybe this connection between soft theorems and uh, and um, and um, and asymptotic symmetries again closes the the circle, or I should say the the triangle, if we also consider uh, memory effects, uh, and bring back you know the the together the quantum field theories to people you know in uh, in geometry and in general. Again, this was just a curiosity. And now let me move towards my holographic motivation. So where is holography in this story? We need to stipulate what we mean by holography. And nowadays, we are so biased by ADSFT, which we all, uh, that we always think about holography as being the statement that if you have, that you have a theory 
of gravity in a, in a, in a space time in a given sector of of um, you know you have a theory of gravity in 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 a space time characterized by a particular value of of a cosmological constant like anti sitter with negative cosmological constant and we assume or actually we see this as to be dual to a theory of uh, of quantum theory without gravity associated to the boundary in terms of Penrose compactification of the space time and in ADSFT uh, the dual theory is a conformal field theory, and the equivalence actually, the, the duality is actually given by an, uh, an equality of partition function between the conformal field theory, let's say, associated or living on the boundary, and the, um, the gravitational theory in the bulk. Now, this is by no means a rule for how holography or holographic duality should work, work, because, for example, we also know that there exists a sort of uh, holographic duality for flat gravity, which is the BFSS matrix model, which does not work in the same way as you know the, the rule that I just told you. But okay, this is another story. This is just to, to tell you that uh, when we think about flat holography nowadays, at least the, if I speak about flat holography, I'm thinking about something similar to ADS-CFD and similar, you know, has to be taken with, uh, with uh, some degree of, of, uh, of um, you know, some, some grain of salt. And actually following this idea, uh, which was already put forward by Ed Witten in 1998, uh, we can actually think about the dual of gravitational uh, physics in flat space to be associated with the null boundaries, which are scry minus and scry plus, so past and future null infinity in the Perros diagram, and to be something that he called at the time structure X, which has to give us, you know, the task of holography is that uh, we have to reconstruct the entire um, information, the entire gravitational information, which is encoded in the S matrix in the bulk. And when I say a yes, matrix, I also mean the complete uh, formation and evaporation of black holes. So this is the ultimate goal of this approach to holography. And now we can actually understand why soft theorems and asymptotic, uh, the relationship between soft theorems and asymptotic symmetries um, is so relevant in understanding this uh, proposal. Uh, put forward by Witten, because this is the first example in which in flat space we can see that some well-known bulk physics is derived from the boundary, so in some sense holographically. And because of this, we now have basically all the bustling uh, uh, research activity on the flat holography proposal, which is understood from various points of view what uh, we call celestial holography, but also Carolian holography, and so on and so forth. By the way, uh, as I already said, I think two, two months ago, you already had in this series of seminars um, a, a discussion on celestial holography. I'm not going to discuss any of these proposals in detail, but I will actually now give you my point of view, which I believe is the point of view of the broader community, which is the following. So if you wake up tomorrow morning and you'd say, ah, I have a nice idea. My, uh, I have a model for flat holography in which this structure X is based on potatoes and tomatoes. Well, if your model is supposed to work, the first thing that you have to check is that the soft theorems and uh, is that, sorry, uh, let me say this properly, is that the symmetries of your model which are to be associated with the asymptotic symmetries of the space-time, must encode more or less explicitly the soft theorems. So given that this is the point of view that I would like to advocate here, now we can complete the research program, the research questions that uh, uh, I put forward before. Again, by remembering that soft theorems exist in any dimension greater or equal to four, we can actually ask not only whether the relationship with asymptotic symmetries is a um, universal feature of gravity, but also whether this reflects itself in any manifestation of flat holography. 
And as a bonus point, I would also uh, basically drag the discussion towards um, how much of ADS-CFD we can actually transfer to flat tolerant. And this is a, a question that uh, uh, for, for which I'm going to give uh, not an answer, but just some, some hints. And uh, we already know that there are many things of ADS-CFD that cannot uh, be mapped to, to flat tolerant. But there are some other things which are at least interesting, um, interesting uh, similarities. OK, so now I will move toward a sort of, uh, as I said, cartoonish explanation of how things work. And this is supposed to give us all the conceptual and technical ingredients for uh, showing that the soft theorems are related to asymptotic symmetries. And also, to it will, it will uh, um, give me the possibility to tell you what happens in higher dimensions. So I will now focus on four dimensions. Let me remind you that now what are asymptotic symmetries? Uh, asymptotic symmetries are also called, as I said, large gauge transformations. And these are basically the, whenever you have a gauge theory, these are the gauge transformations which act as proper uh, symmetries on, uh, on the theory. So as proper symmetries on the, on the states of the theory. These are basically characterized by saying that uh, among all the allowed gauge transformations, there are some gauge transformations which are not just the redundancies and which are associated with non-trivial non -trivial charges. In, uh, in some more naive term, um, when we will do the, basically in a moment, the, the gravitational description, we will just consider them as being the different morphisms of the space-time that do not die off at infinity. And so the BMS group, which was discovered in the 60s by Bondi, Metzner, Van der Burg, and Sachs, is indeed the asymptotic symmetries of asymptotically locally Minkowskian space time. Sorry, of asymptotically Minkowskian space time. Um, it has the following uh, structure um, it contains Lorentz transformations and super translations. I will show you again the picture of uh, my representation of super translations later. But what does it mean that it's the asymptotic symmetry of asymptotically Minkowskian space time? Well, it means that you can consider the problem of finding, you know, the space time, um, um, the space time structure far from, let's say, the sources of the gravitational field. And uh, you want to describe it uh, towards null infinity. So you set a coordinate system which is associated, which is actually adapted to, to the propagation of the waves, so uh, null, null rays. And uh, you expect that asymptotically the space time becomes Minkowski. So this is this first part here is just Minkowski space. The dynamics of the space time will be then encoded just in the subleading terms in, uh, in the radial expansion in R. So, Think about uh, Schwarzschild space time. Schwarzschild space time just have uh, a mass parameter which comes here at order one over r. And in general, also relative space time are can be described in this way. Now, in recent years, because of this connection with soft theorems, which uh, I'm going to to show you in a moment, an extension of the BMS group has been uh, also defined. And this extension involves uh, actually an extension of the Lorentz part of the BMS group, which is called, which goes under the name of super rotations. Now, in four dimensions, super rotations comes in two varieties, which I have tried to, 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 to specify here in the picture, but we do not need to discuss this uh, now. And um, basically, what are super rotations? They are just transformations on the uh, cross sections or the sections of null infinity, which is here on the left represented by this uh, cone, where uh, along the generators of null infinity, we see the action of super translations, basically are point dependent translations. So you can think of uh, super translations and super rotations now to be the asymptotic symmetry of what we call asymptotically locally flat space times or asymptotically local Minkowskian, where basically you just require that the boundary metric is not fixed to be the global Minkowski metric, but it can it can change. 
And again, the reason for this uh, extension has been actually understood in terms of soft theorems. If you if you open any other uh, paper uh, on gravitational literature before 2014, there was no notion basically, uh, well, more or less of super rotations with some some small, uh, yeah, some, some small remarks in some papers which were associated with holography anyway. So I have described, again, with pictures, the asymptotic transformations. But now, as I said, we need to build them to, 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 to give them a notion of canonical generators. You know, we, we, they, have to be some, they have to be symmetry. So they have to act as canonical generators on a, on a phase space. And this is done by actually constructing the charges. And once you construct the charges, well, just to, to, to give you a sort of orientation, one of these charges is, uh, is quite famous, and it's the bond mass uh, charge, which is basically what, you, what an observer can measure if uh, measure basically the energy of the space-time at a particular uh, instant of retarded time, OK? Um, you may be more familiar with the ADM mass. Well, the ADM mass is just the limit uh, under particular case, circumstances of the bondy mass uh, as it goes towards space like infinity. And the bondy mass is quite important because it tells you how the energy is radiated in, in nonlinear general relativity. This was actually the smoking gun when Bondi discovered this. Thing. The theoretical smoking gun for the existence of gravity waves in the full-fledged nonlinear gravitational theory. Okay, so now once you have constructed your charges, well, these are charges that act on an asymptotic phase space. So uh, they act on this on the on the in and out states of the scattering process. And in order to make the action actually consistent, you have to make sure that there is a unique symmetry group acting both on past null infinity and future null infinity, so scry minus and scry plus. And this is done by imposing conditions on the fields on these purple uh, circles in the, in the diagram, so near uh, space-like infinity. And once you do this, you can conjecture following Strominger that the S matrix commutes with the um, with asymptotic charges. And once you analyze the consequences of this uh, uh, commutation in an appropriate momentum basis, you see that you get the soft theorems. So this is how the story unfolded in four dimensions. Now, you can ask, OK, well, why don't we do the same thing in five dimensions? Well, where, where is the problem in, in, in higher dimensions, not only five, six, and so on? Where is the problem? Well. According to some older GR literature, the asymptotic symmetry of gravity at null infinity was uh, just defined to be the Poincaré group. I forgot an accent. The Poincaré group. And so let me explain you how this comes about. So the idea is that, again, the the, the boundary structure does not change, it's just Minkowski. So the, the, if there is something that goes wrong, it's in the subleading terms in the, in the asymptotic expansion. And the subleading terms are actually given by uh, this, um, by this uh, by, by in this form here. So where D is the, is the space-time dimension, you see that uh, the first subleading term, which is defined to be this, because it's associated to uh, the behavior of linearized radiation on Minkowski space, is further subleading in dimensions higher than four with respect to four dimensions. So in, if you require that your asymptotic killing vectors or the large gauge diffeomorphism that preserve the boundary metric and the falloff conditions need to satisfy this kind of falloff behavior, then what happens is that you have more constraint stemming from this equation in higher dimensions rather than in four. And basically, what were super translations in higher dimensions with this kind of uh, behavior of the metric just uh, collapsed to be standard translations. And I insist this metric was actually set in order to be 
compatible with the behavior of linearized radiation at infinity. Okay, so we have basically um, a clash between the uh, the existence of soft terms in any dimensions and what we claim the the super the the, the, the asymptotic symmetries are. Uh, the way to, to analyze the problem, since we believe in, in you know, you, you can go through the proof of soft theorems and there is no uh, no hidden assumption there. We have to work on on the on the gravitational side. And from the story that I told you uh, a few minutes ago, we just can draw a shopping list, a checklist of things that we have to reanalyze in higher dimensions in order to, to address the problem that, uh, that I addressed at the beginning. So we have to first solve Einstein equations with null boundaries, trying to remove assumptions that uh, are maybe due to our bias. Then we have to impose boundary conditions in near space like infinity. Remember, in order to connect the past and future null infinity. And once this is done, you can actually proceed and construct the charges. If the charges are non trivial, then you can say that there are these asymptotic symmetries. If the charges are trivial, then you, you, you have to go back to the standard uh, idea that uh, you don't have enough asymptotic symmetries in higher dimensions. Once you do this, then you can derive, uh, you can opt to derive the soft theorems as you do in four dimensions. Okay, so just uh, a comment. I mean, some of these analyses uh, already appeared in the literature in the past with some partial partial results, and uh, now I will move on to this detail of uh, our work of the papers that I advertised uh, at the beginning. Um, are there questions already, or can I go on? I think, uh, okay. Seems like you can go on. Okay, so I will analyze the problem following those four points that I just said. And the first thing is to solve Einstein equations. Now I can tell you in which gauge we are solving Einstein equations. We solve them in bond gauge, which is again this gauge adapted to uh, null foliation of the space time. And for simplicity, I will just solve uh, the vacuum Einstein equation. So R mu nu equal to zero. And the funny thing about this uh, gauge, or actually the quite comfortable thing about this gauge, is that the Einstein equations organize themselves in a sort of a nested way in which um, given some data on one of these red surfaces, which would be your initial characteristic surface, then you can determine the metric functions. And in particular, I hope it's clear from, from this, uh, from the left-hand side, the three first equation, the first three equations, which determine beta, W, and U in, the, in, in this matrix, only require U to, the, to prescribe the expansion of H on one of these surfaces. And the solution is actually given in terms of uh, some integ integration functions. There is a fourth equation which tells you how the H, or as I call it here, G by this definition, that you impose on, on this initial surface evolves to a later surface. And this also comes with, the, with an integration function. Then there are other two equations which tell you how this integration function, which is associated with the angular momentum of the space time, and this integration function, which is associated with the mass of the space time, evolving time. And the last equation, equation is just a trivial equation. Um, just for simplicity, I will give you the result for this case of boundary conditions. Um, and the result is given by this very messy expansion. And I'm not going to tell you, so I told you that you know you have to impose the H expansion here, but the actual way in which uh, uh, this expansion was derived in, in this uh, earlier paper um, is not to impose the, the, the expansion of H on one initial null surfaces, but to actually only impose the, actually only impose the, the, the leading order term and then use the fourth main equation, this one here, to make the 
the expansion in on on the later null surfaces to be self consistent. Um, yeah, okay. The detail the detail of how it was derived it's it's not important now. You can ask later if you want. But the 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 important point is that now you see that uh, this expansion starts from the order one over r, which is the order that in four dimensions is associated to super translations. But this is an expansion valid in any number of dimensions. If you remember, this was the um, yeah the assumption in the in the previous papers. So the 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 relative fall off comes here, subleading with respect to to the large gauge degrees of freedom, and then okay we have a bunch of uh, these terms in uh, in in this magenta color. These are all the logarithmic terms, all the independent logarithmic terms that uh, are uh, in the in the asymptotic expansion. But okay, we won't uh, actually discuss them so much today, um, if not only in this small slide. Uh, let me focus on this part of the metric expansion. And so in four dimensions, as I said, um, the um, radiative order, which is order d minus two over two, exactly corresponds to order one, because you just have to put the equal form. And so the large gauge modes appear at the same order as the radiative order. And in fact, the order one is uh, a free function. It's not constrained by Einstein equations. And OK, I mean, just the, the, these logarithmic terms are have a trivial time evolution. In higher dimensions, as I already said, the large gauge modes are overleading with respect to the radiation order. And actually, they contribute to, to a modification of what we mean by radiation in higher dimensions, because you, know, you need to define this concept in a gauge invariant way, which would mean uh, casting together this h d minus 2 over 2 with the overleading terms in order to have a gauge invariant motion. But the important thing for, 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 for the rest is that this h1 is non-trivial, is non-trivially zero in, in, uh, in, four dimen in, in higher dimension, sorry, uh, if you allow for uh, boundary conditions which are consistent with the action of super rotations. There is a, a small thing that I would like to say concerning the, the logarithmic term, which is this. So the U evolution of this logarithmic term is trivial in all dimensions, and this is non-trivial for generic boundary conditions in even dimensions. And this is this appears to be related with some anomaly action. So just keep this uh, uh, this in mind, and I will come back to this comment later at the end, basically. So what we've done so far is to have analyzed the first point of this checklist. So we have defined a solution space for Einstein gravity, and now we move to imposing boundary conditions near I0. And now I will follow the, the recent paper in which we work in even dimensions. Um, and we impose the boundary conditions near space-like infinity to be of the form of uh, a constraint on the Riemann tensor, um, which automatically implies that there is no flux of radiation in this region near space-like infinity. And it has also another effect, which is the effect of removing all logarithmic terms from the solution space. So this is quite convenient because we don't have to, to, to work with all these uh, very funny logarithmic terms and uh, yeah, it's computational convenient. So basically we have this metric expansion. Again, I'm just showing you the, the relevant term. The color convention is again, blue is associated with the super translation degrees of freedom. Red is the super rotation. And there is another degrees of freedom, which is a vile sort of degrees of freedom, uh, which will, I mean, play a crucial role in the paper, but uh, not 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 in in the discussion today because otherwise uh, it will be too involved. Um, the take-home lesson now is that we have imposed this kind of conditions near space like infinity, and we are now ready, having done first and second point, we are now ready to go and construct asymptotic charts. There is a question by Linda. Federico, exactly. Before you move on, please. Yeah, so we have an anonymous question, an anonymous question for one. Uh, the question is, did you assume R is zero when solving the Einstein equations? And if so, is there a reason to do so? 
Um, oh, sorry. Um, am I still sharing the screen? Sorry. Yes, can, yes, you are. Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, did you assume R is zero uh, when solving the Einstein equation? So the, the, the scalar Riemann potential? Um, and if no, so no, no. Yeah, so the question, the answer is no, we didn't assume R to be equal to zero. And then there was another question. Uh, no, that was the question. And the, uh, the, the follow up was, and if so, is there a reason to do so? No, no. So we didn't assume R equal to zero. We just solved, uh, so for the Ricci tensor, so the you, you take Einstein equations in the case uh, of, um, of pure vacuum, and you can just reorganize them to be just uh, R nu nu uh, equal to zero. So, I mean, you have to solve this, right? I mean, it, it's not automatically true that R is equal to zero. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be clear. So, okay, so um, let's move to, to the third point, uh, which is the construction of asymptotic charges. And here you can follow whatever method you want. Again, um, this is just, uh, if you like, classical mechanics applied to, to, to general relativity, because well, we, we, we follow the covariant phase space procedure, which means that we take uh, our Lagrangian, which is the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian. Um, you take a first variation of the Lagrangian and uh, you will generate uh, a boundary term, which is this d theta. And theta is called presymplectic uh, current, uh, which again, just uh, do it by yourself. If you take uh, the Lagrangian of a point particle, so L equal to Q dot square, then uh, you notice that this presymplectic current basically takes the form of P delta Q. So it's momentum uh, uh, with, with the times times basically the, the, this uh, exterior derivative or, or variation of, of, the, of, the, of the coordinates. And then upon taking another variation, um, you build the symplectic form, which is in the standard, uh, uh, in the standard form that you know from classical mechanics. Um, once you have a symplectic form, if the symplectic form is uh, non-degenerate and finite and uh, integrable, you can actually, I mean, you, you can actually go and define your Hamiltonian charge and you can integrate this equation to get uh, a finite Hamiltonian if the, the, the right-hand side is also integral. Okay. So these are standard steps which apply to our particular case, um, bring to a presymplectic current, which is divergent in large R. And this probably is also one of the reasons why in the past people um, didn't consider the possibility of having super translations and super rotations in higher dimensions, because if you don't have super translation and super rotation, then these divergences disappear and everything is fine. So what we do with these divergences? Well, there is a way to renormalize the divergences, which is basically by shifting the presymplectic currents by um, this codimension to form Y. Um, I mean, this is uh, well known that uh, this is something that this corresponds to one of the of the ambiguities of the covariant phase space method, and. The point is that people in in uh, in literature around BMS uh, in four dimensions always use this kind of redefinitions. But the point of novelty, I believe, in our proposal is that we build the form Y to be local and covariant, uh, which means basically that it has only to depend on the induced matrix on the on let's say this green blob here, so the roughly speaking the celestial sphere and it's extrinsic curvature. Now, if you are familiar with the ADS-CFT, local and covariance is a requirement that it's usually done in holographic normalization. Let me comment about this later. But once we do the uh, renormalization of the, uh, of the presymplectic current, the symplectic form reads uh, like this. So we have two terms, the first two terms, which are um, fine, 
And the last term, which is not uh, a, a, a delta exact term, and then this means that um, in, you cannot define an Hamiltonian for the BMS charge simply by integrating this equation, because there is an unintegrable piece on the right-hand side. Um, so again, this is not a surprise. Uh, yeah, maybe you say I take the, the question later. Just let me finish this. Um, this is not a surprise because also in four dimensions, so we know that we have similar integrability issue. And the standard way to deal with this, at least uh, if you want to, 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 to build up to, to the soft theorem story, is to focus on the integrable parts of the sympathetic form and define the charges from the integrable parts. Once you define the charges from the integral part in this way, then you can check that they represent the BMS algebra in a consistent way and they act on the, on the phase space consistently. Um, um, yeah, so maybe now I can take the question, Jose. It's a, it's a very quick, very naive question. Um, so the, the redundancy in the definition of what you call the, I think you call it presympathetic current. Yeah. Um, so the, or the presympathetic potential, or the, the sympathetic uh, potential, um, that's, that redundancy as a, as an exact differential, I mean, in the usual sympathetic formulation that happens because then if you want to look at the, the sympathetic form, that would be the exterior derivative of that. And then you have that the square of the exterior derivative vanishes. In this case, um, you got the correction term to your sympathetic form. Yeah. yeah. Right? So I mean, so, it is, I it's think this has to do with the fact that this is the covariant phase formulation. It's it's not the so can you can you maybe tell me what's yeah, going yeah. on there? Why is it that term not, just yeah? Not zero? So sorry, sorry, yes. So I was not clear. Um so the differential of the exterior derivative on the phase space in this notation is delta. Okay. But this d here. I just used to denote the the differential operator, let's say, in the space time. So uh, that's why you you see this correction. Okay. Okay. I, I see. I see. I see the the problem. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry. So this, this yeah, is just it's, to say it's a matter of the definition a, of. Uh... Yeah, this is just to say that this is a boundary term that localizes, let's say, if you like, on these blobs. And then, okay, the, 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 indeed, when you take the delta of this theta, this uh, omega, the omega changes in this way. I, uh, okay, okay. Uh, I hope you. it's clear. Yeah, it was my mistake on the definition of the sympathetic form. Yeah. Um, okay, so now we are also done with the construction of the synthetic charges. So you just go and uh, try to turn the crank to derive the soft theorems. And indeed, in um, six and even dimensions, the story holds exactly, once you have done all these steps, holds exa exactly, uh, you know, the computation is exactly similar to the four dimensional case. Um, I think I am really close to the end. And uh, so let's uh, draw the, the conclusion. Is the relationship between soft theorems and asymptotic symmetries a universal figure of gravitational theory independently, independently of the dimension of the space-time? You already noticed that I, at the end of the day, I restricted to even dimensions. And the answer in even dimensions is yes. But what is the problem with all dimensions? Well, the problem with all dimensions is that it's uh, the, the phase space structure and also the asymptotic structure is still poorly understood. And there seemed to be a sort of mismatch between what I didn't introduce this notation yet, but what is the the the, the hard modes in the in the in the charges and the soft modes in the in the charges. So this is just if you if you're familiar with this terminology, um, this is the key to 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 understand why all dimensions is uh, is a bit tricky. And I said, yes, even the mention is basically, I would consider it solved, but there are many interesting open questions, uh, which also relates to how much of ADS CFT concept and technology apply to the problem of photography. And in particular, I will comment on saying that the approach that we develop of phase space normalization, which again is not new, but the, the, the spirit of putting local and covariant counter terms is something novel in our favor is highly inspired by ADS CFT holographic normalization. Um, but 
uh, it has to be reanalyzed from scratch if we, if I want to consider the, the, the phase space with logarithmic terms. And there is an interesting point in the phase space with log logarithmic term, which I already mentioned a bit, which is that logarithmic terms in all dimensional ADS space times are associated with conformal anomalies. Now, if you slice the interior of your even dimensional, um, let's say six dimensional flat space with uh, um, Milner slicing, then we have anti de Sitter and the Sitter sections, basically. And you can see that there is a, a very similar uh, matching between the logarithmic term that I discussed before and the logarithmic term that appear in ADS. And again, this could be quite an interesting point to analyze from the point of view of holographic anomalies in flat space. If, um, um, yeah, uh, this is a comment that I like to make, and I hope that this tells you something. And uh, I will uh, conclude it here. Thank you.